Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from the OECD's Pillar 2 to U.S. tax regulatory developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Leader. Check out PwC Policy on Demand news platform that provides in-depth insights and analysis on tax policy developments. Policy on Demand is now available for free at policyondemand.pwc.com. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, we're back in Westminster Studios in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm excited to be joined by Michael Leckie. Mike is PwC's International Tax Services Global Technology Leader and a partner in the Quantitative Solutions and Technologies practice. Mike, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on. Glad to be here. Always good to have another Clevelander uh, on, on the podcast. So Mike, before we dive into the latest OECD Pillar 2 documents that were released in December of 2022, you and I are about the same vintage, but we've had very different paths that have converged over the last several years as international tax has become increasingly reliant on technology. So first, you have a degree in accounting and computer information systems, and that was really before that was a thing. I, I assume first that that means you're an expert in Lotus One Two Three. Do I do I have you dated appropriately? Yeah, I actually knew Lotus when it was just Lotus One. So okay, all right. So maybe that was like the tail end of my education when I got to the. I don't know when the two and the three came in, but uh, for some of our newer practitioners, that was the standard, right? Before uh, some of the spreadsheets that came out. So, so Mike, maybe because you've had just such an interesting career journey, just a couple of minutes on how did you get involved with international tax technology and really building technology solutions? So I started my career uh, really focusing on a very bespoke um, international tax quantitative calculation that was very heavily data focused. So that required us to actually look at other technologies outside of spreadsheets. And remind us, what, what what was that provision for those that have been practicing for a while? Oh, uh, that would have been the uh, Foreign Sales Corporation. The FISC and the, the FISC rules. The FISC rules All back right. in the day. Um, and so because of that, we had to go and look at other technology to be able to perform those computations and to do the analysis in a way that was beneficial to our, to our taxpayers. So I really got involved with that straight away early in my career. Yep. And as we needed to evolve, um, the technology to handle other parts of international tax. You know, we just kept growing it and, and expanding on it. And I was able to take a lead role in that, um, probably more just out of uh, dumb luck and where I was sitting at the time, uh, you know, in Minneapolis than, uh, than anything else. Yeah, so it really started with the FISC rules and, and this idea of creating one centralized location within a system to be able to compute yep. a taxpayer's you know, tax calculations in the case of FISC. And now obviously you're spending a lot of time on U.S. international tax calculations and, and now on, on Pillar 2. And I, I know the idea has been to, to really centralize those calculations to increase quality, to manage some of the risks that are inherent in a, in a spreadsheet environment. So how has this technology evolved recently in the area of international tax? And we had John McDonald on, you know, a number of podcasts ago, and he was talking about some of the new technology that's used kind of outside of a spreadsheet environment that really can enhance consistency and equality, including graph. But maybe you tell us a little bit about how technology has evolved recently in the area. Well, I think just like the, the law has evolved, um, it's become more reliant on relationships and where does one number affect the next number? So we've, we've continually looked at what are the different technologies that we can actually look at to help us uncover or discover those, those relationships. So we have moved more towards a graph-based technology. Um, we, we view that that allows us a lot more insight into the calculations, into the data, but more importantly, how they relate to each other and how they connect to each other, which I think as we start to talk about some of the other topics today, and if you think about just some of the more recent tax law changes in the U.S., You'll, you'll start to see that you know one number doesn't just affect one number. There's a multiple of, of where those those numbers uh, end up affecting in relationships that, that they create. Yeah, one of the big challenges I know that organizations have is that, and this goes back to the Lotus One Two Three. So many of us were trained right in spreadsheets. And so um, what has been your experience in, in trying to get, you know, your teams and, and, and taxpayers and others trained on doing calculations out see, outside a spreadsheet environment? And, and how challenging is that for, for organizations and uh, um, consultants? I, I think it's, it's really challenging because it's, it's a different way of looking at, at numbers, at calculations. I think the key to it is, is how 
how do you use visualizations to help bring the data alive? And I think the better we do it, you know, visualizing the data, the better off we are with helping get over that kind of, you know, speed bump of the change in how we're looking at calculations, how we're looking to solve problems, how we're looking to identify opportunities. So I, I think it's really in that space. And that, again, is where the graph becomes very, um, very uh, powerful is the, the way it helps us visualize a calculation, how numbers come together, how they're dependent on each other. And I think that's where, where a lot of that is, is going to head in the future. And that really resonates with me because obviously I'm not a technologist and I've got accounting background, but then a tax law you know, and have spent, frankly, most of my time doing more of the qualitative than the quantitative aspects, at least earlier in my career. I guess I can't say that anymore now, given all the quantitative work that I've done. But your point really resonates to me and that having a technology, if it's outside of the spreadsheet environment, as you're training people, if people can understand visually how those relationships work, it certainly makes the transition a lot easier. All right, so let's move on to, to pillar two, and we can layer in some of the technology aspects throughout our discussion. So in December of 2022, the OECD released a number of documents related to the global anti-base erosion rules, otherwise known as Pillar 2. The two we're going to focus on today are the Safe Harbor and Penalty Relief document and a public consultation document called the Pillar 2 Globe Information Return, which I challenge may be a bit of a misnomer, but we'll, uh, we'll get into that. So let's start with the safe harbor and the penalty relief guidance, as I think many of us were optimistic this could significantly relieve taxpayers' administrative and compliance costs. And I'm, that's a quote from, from the document about relieving taxpayers' administrations and compliance costs when it comes to calculating the Pillar 2 top-up tax. So maybe before we get into the, the three specific temporary safe harbors, just what are your initial thoughts, reactions, overview of the, of the safe harbors um, that were presented by the OECD? I think my, my initial reaction was I, I'm not sure how much this, this will help from a simplification point of view. Um, I, I think when you start to look at w what the data points are and, and what you'll need to do to get those data points, um, I think it brings in some extra extra work, um, some potentially rethinking of, of old processes. So is, is that simplification? Maybe in the long term, but I think as you look at like some of the safe harbors they're, they're limited in their in their time frame. So are you gonna reap the benefits of redoing process and, and technology in the short term, you know, to, 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 to get to these safe harbors? Yeah, and let's unpack that for a minute, because one of the things, I mean, really the principal piece of information um, that is required for, for these safe harbors is country by country data. Mm -hmm. And I think, frankly, maybe that took me, and I, I don't know if others, a, a little by surprise, is that this concept of a qualifying country by country report at least for purposes of, of frankly, the of the denominator of your globe income to, to try to get to, into to one of these safe harbors, which again, we'll unpack. But um, maybe what, what, are, what are some of the challenges with country by country data? And then frankly, you still need qualifying financial statement information to, to, to come up with taxes and some of the others, but what are some of the challenges from your experience, particularly with country by country data? Well, I, I think the, the first challenge is, is getting comfortable with, with the data that's in those reports. Um, you know, C by C by C has always been the country by country has always been more of an informational type return. Right, doesn't impact tax liability. Doesn't impact ta tax liability. So the question is, is is how is is it a qualified uh, re report? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's going to need to be some effort put around that to to understand that. Um, if it's not, or if it's a little iffy, then now you're changing business process, maybe technology, um, in, in in understanding like how how to get there. So I, I think that's where I, I kind of pause when I say, can is this simplifying or right. not? And, and, that, and the data doesn't stop there, right? It's not country by country. Well, if you just do your country right. by country report, then you're done. There's still a whole bunch of other information that is required in addition to the country by country report. Right. I mean, so you have your qualified financial statements. You got to go get your income taxes. But I think the one that I, th I think, and, and this is kind of an overall theme I think we see in some of these um, reports that are out there is that data is readily available. It, it's just automatic. And when you think about your uncertain tax positions, I'm not sure there's an account in most you know, clients, taxpayers' systems that have that. I, I, my experience has always been, it's on you know, side schedules, it's an amalgamation of a multiple different positions, whatever it may be. So to go find that information, figure that out, to be able to even do the safe harbor, might involve new processes, maybe new technology, maybe new ways of thinking about stuff, which I think is going to, again, 
doesn't help with simplification. Yeah, I agree, in particular on the covered taxes point. And I mean, frankly, there's a number of uh, of other provisions as well, but on, on the covered taxes point, there's still a whole lot of work that needs to be done. It's not mm-hmm. just getting the, the country by country data kind of up to snuff. The other thing I will, I've reflected on with the country by country data, particularly for the public companies, is your point that the country by country data or the country by country report, first of all, um, there's no tax liability, right? So it probably hasn't received some of the scrutiny from, for example, financial statement auditors or even mm-hmm. internally that maybe obviously like other tax returns uh, would, would, would have been. The other thing that I think is really important to remind listeners is that there will be public country by country reporting by the end of the year as required under the EU. So, you know, as part of taxpayers thinking about their country by country reports, now layering in this this pillar to um, safe harbor, uh, maybe an opportunity and kind of just another reason to spend even more time with country by country reports before public disclosure uh, happens. Yeah, Doug. And I think if, if I look for an analogy somewhere, I think if you think about, you know, 2017, Pre that time, you know, the, the filings for controlled foreign corporations was, for the most part, for 90% of the world was 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 informational. Right. right? That's did, what it said on the return, right. too, right? And and for 5471, information right. returns. And, and, and 10% of the, the, the companies out there, or 10% of the companies within the, in the taxpayer, you, you, dug, you dug into because they had an income tax effect, right? Like sub F or whatever the case might be. Right. Well, now, with 17, all of a sudden, all of those became important again. And so all of a sudden you had to dig in and, and make sure that the information you were getting for those information returns was was, was the right data. And I, I view this as a very similar type exercise. Yeah, it's a great point. And for, for our non-US practitioners, what Mike referring to as part of the Tax Cuts and Job Act in 2017, they introduced our guilty regime, which we've spent a lot of time talking about the global intangible low taxed income. And to your point, you know, it really fundamentally changed the reporting requirements mm-hmm. for taxpayers because all of a sudden every CFC, absent, you know, some overall losses or whatever, but generally speaking, CFCs now, all of them had a potential impact on taxable income. So it really required additional diligence for those U.S. parented companies or sandwich structures where the U.S. had subsidiaries. I think it's, it's a great point. So let's talk about um, the the temporary safe harbors just just quickly and wanted to go through the three. Um, maybe we'll first start with the with the de minimis test. How does that work, Mike? So the de minimis test will we'll look at your C by C data and look at revenue. Um, it needs to be under 10 million mm-hmm. and it will look at your you know pre pre-tax profit um, on on the C by C data and it needs to be under a million. Um, you know, I think the important part is it's it's an and test, so you need to meet both. Right. Um, and so, I mean, in, in, if you have a qualifying CBCR, that would be a, a simplifying, um, you know, safe harbor to fall into. Um, but again, back to all the other things we've been talking about, you know. Yeah, and I think that is is kind of a welcome relief because I know one of the challenges that you know, taxpayers had had was the definition of constituent entity and the model rules, um, specifically that also applies to what would otherwise be immaterial entities in the financial statements. So in other words, even if that entity doesn't end up on the financial statements because it's immaterial, it still is considered a constituent entity. So if you're below the 10 million and the 1 million euro, respectively, it, you know, and then you need to make sure your country by country reports are qualifying to be able to rely on that. But that, in my view, could be a, a potential uh, 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 help for, for tax taxpayers. Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, the second one is the effective rate test. I think this is one that I think many of us are, are very focused on. Um, how does the effective rate test work in the, the safe harbors? Well, it's similar like with the with the globe rules. Um, you know, you, you get to a, a, a new covered tax, which is what we were talking about before with the qualified financial statements over your, your income off your C by C. And if you're above the applicable rate, then you get to you know ignore that jurisdiction. I think the important part about that, where potentially again it could be simplifying, um, is that it's at the jurisdiction level. Right. So you're not having to go down a constituent entity level uh, to to do this analysis. But again, all the things we've talked about, you know, need to kind of be there to to. to enjoy that simplification. Right. Yeah. And a couple of important things to note for listeners is that, first of all, this is a temporary safe harbor, right? And uh, so it applies for three years. And then the way they've structured the safe harbor is that 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 effective rate test is 15% for 2024. So presumably for those jurisdictions that implement the income inclusion rules, effective 1-1-24, you'll, you've got a 15%. And then moves to 16% for 2025 and then 17% for, for, for 2026. So that rate goes up as, and then in, in uh, 
presumably in 2027, the temporary safe harbors are off the table and we'll have to look to potential uh, permanent safe harbors, which we'll cover here in a minute. Um, so the, the last one then is the routine profits test. What, is, what does that mean? Well, the routine profits test is you'll use the globe rules to calculate your, your routine profits. And if, and if that is, is greater than your income, then you would you know, be able to have a safe harbor again at the jurisdictional level. Um, so again, again, it's a simplifying um, provision on the surface. The, the question is the data underneath it. Because uh, again, you have to go get the same data you're looking for for the full globe rules to, to do that, to do that calculation. How readily available is it? Where is it at? And, and all that fun stuff. Right, because it's the it's the PBT of the country by country report has to be smaller or equal to the substance based income exclusion rule, which really requires you to do a whole bunch of different calculations right. under the regular model rules and right. commentary to figure out what that substance based income exclusion is, and then have to look at the C by CR. So you still really still need to do both calculations. That one I'm a little skeptical if it's any simplifying at all. But at least you know for taxpayers that that can meet that they they don't have to file whatever those that return turn might be. So which which we'll get back to. Right. So the OECD did not provide detail Mike on the permanent safe harbor. They did set out a framework for a permanent simplified calculation. Um how does that work uh, in general? I, 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 from the guidance and the request for comments that they 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 asked for is they want to make sure they don't violate the spirit of, of what they're trying to accomplish with with the globe rules. So I think they're they're looking for some some feedback from from taxpayers on what could that be. Um, I I think though you're, you're back to probably having to look at qualified financial statements again. So the question really becomes if we're not going if they're not going to violate the, the 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 theory of the rules, how much different will the data be? How simplified can they really get? Um, it'd be interesting to see where where this heads. Yeah, and. Uh... Um, I, I think the, the 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 they mentioned in the document that they will not be relying on C by CR. So we'll have this three-year transition looking at C by CR. To your point, you're going to have to look at qualifying financial statement in, data, and it's just like, well, if you have to do all these calculations and look at all of this, how simplifying is that permanent safe harbor? So right. hopefully, you know, taxpayers will be able to enjoy one of those three um, exceptions. Um, one of the other things that I, I failed to mention that I also think is important, Mike, and particularly re related to the routine profits test, is that that test will also be met for a jurisdiction where it has a loss per the, mm. the, the C by CR. And so I know that's been uh, an area of concern or questions and frankly has created a lot of confusion just in the calculation itself when you have potentially some losses um, and some of the implications for that. But at least if you do have a C by CR loss in a particular jurisdiction, again, qualifying C by CR, you will be deemed to meet the routine profits test. Um, so I think that is... Uh, well noted. A couple of other things are well taken. A couple of other things to note on the safe harbors, Mike. First of all, that the Article 9.1 transition rules apply um, for purposes of this country by country test. So it's kind of interesting. Like you got to grab this country by country data, but then layer on, um, particularly you know some of the other rules within the the model rules. So um, take some additional work. And and the one thing to note on the the transition rules is that it does include that the rules for deferred tax assets that are created during the transition period. So as companies that are doing deals or doing integrations or restra internal restructurings, a lot of traps for the unwary. Um, other thing I wanted to note is that um, the safe harbor rules apply to JVs, um, but allow companies to look at qualifying financial statements because many times in the context of a joint venture arrangement, depending on ownership, they may not file as part of the country by country report. Again, that begs the question of, well, how simplifying is that if you have to use right. the, the qualified financial <laughs> right. statements? Um, and then last and certainly not least is that stateless constituent entities and multi-parent multinational um, enterprises with no uh, single qualifying country by country report are excluded from the safe harbor. So you cannot rely on the stateless jurisdiction and country by country or for multi-parented and uh, or for uh, uh, multi-parented enterprises. So um, maybe before we move on to the, the globe in information return, kind of is this really kind of coming back? We've alluded to this uh, overall kind of a, a safe harbor that will relieve taxpayers' administrative and compliance costs. And I think that certainly some taxpayers will be, you know, find some of these exclusions welcome. I think that 
you know, it, it, it is less of a safe harbor maybe than I think many of us, many of us had hoped, but listen, something's better than nothing. And right. so, you know, I'm the eternal optimist. And so, uh, um, hopefully, you know, and the other important thing to note is that implementing jurisdictions obviously need to be able to have qualifying income inclusion rules and UTPRs, but we'll also see if implementing jurisdictions deviate, um, any from, from what the OECD guidance is. Cause reminder to listeners, these are just proposals, right? Every right. country has to implement these rules themselves themselves, um, which we'll come back to in a bit. All right, so let's turn to the GLOBE information return consultation document, the GLOBE information return or GLOBE information return, depending what your preference is. Maybe, Mike, before we dive in, because I know this issue and particularly data points is near and dear to your heart, what are your kind of overall thoughts and views of, of what's included in the in the document? Well, I think the, the first overall thought is it is a consult document right it, it, this isn't the, the the final thing this is kind of I guess, volley one right of, of what we think or what the OECD is proposing what things could look like um, so I think you keep that in mind this isn't like the the end all be all um, this isn't the final return right, right. this is not, not the even tax close. not return. even close this is right. the first volley right of, of what this could look like I think the second observation I had was the the schedules that were were pulled together in annex uh, one was, was very, um, I guess, I guess at a high level, I was very expected. Um, you know, take the globe rules, and if you started to try to map out what you, what data points were being, um, uh, you know, asked for in, in the different sections, I, I think they, they kind of laid it out the, the what you what you would have expected. Um, I think the part that um, was was interesting was there wasn't really a whole lot of um, how like the constituent entity schedules would relate to the jurisdiction levels, uh, schedules. And I think um, that, that, that to me caught me a little bit by surprise because I think you, if you would read the document and look at the jurisdictional schedules, you might start to go try to gather data around the jurisdictional level where you might not need to. It may just be a sum, summary of your constituent entity information that would be part of that schedule. And there really wasn't a, a that that link there, um, that connection between those two concepts. Which, you know, if we think about you know other tax returns, you know, in, you know in the U.S. other countries, there's usually that kind of you know detailed up to the summarized. Because you know if you think about just the generics of the calculation, right? You're at the detail level. You need to summarize. Then you need to go back down to the detail level. And so there there needs to be for reporting purposes to make it so the local authorities can audit it. You, you want that connection. You want that, you want that clear line of how all that stuff interacts with each other. Yeah, two great points. I want to unpack kind of both of those points. So let's start with, with the first as so far as that, and I think this is really important for, for listeners to understand, this is really the first volley. And I'm actually going to read a few sentences directly from the consultation document, which I generally try to stay away from. But I think this is very important, particularly given the number of questions that I've had. And and, I'll, and I quote, Annex A represents the best efforts of the inclusive framework to identify all the data points of the MNE group that it may need to collect in order to calculate its globe tax liability. Organizing these data points into tables is intended to facilitate a common understanding of each data point, as well as the relationship between them and their connection to the underlying globe calculation mechanics. However, it does not necessarily represent the final form of the GLOBE information return. The calculation of these data points and their organization in line with the GLOBE calculation mechanics constitutes the first step in the process of developing common information filing and exchange requirements, closed quote. And so I think that, you know, a lot of us kind of looked at that. We just, I opened up to Annex A, assuming like, well, this is the return, right? And it's like, wait a minute, the, the top of Annex A1 is, is, is actually titled data points, right? It's not, this is the actual return. And so wanted to just kind of put an exclamation point on that first point that you've made, that this really is the first volley. I think one of the challenges is, is how do you implementing jurisdictions that will enact these rules how do they take that document and actually turn it into to what's going to be required from a compliance perspective? And I think the only hope that I have is that there is consistency across jurisdictions um, in so far as what that what that filing requirement looks like, because this is already going to to be challenging just doing the calculations if we have, you know, a hundred or however many countries actually implement these rules if they have different compliance requirements. So the other point that 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 you made that that I wanted to unpack a little bit was the point that the 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 data points that are in the the globe information return 
a really constituent entity, right? On a constituent entity basis. And your point is, is that there can be multiple constituent entities that will constitute a, you know, that through an election, you can, that will constitute the calculation that's required for one jurisdiction. And then obviously, then you need to, to do these calculations, right, to ultimately show what is your covered taxes over the globe income in that respective jurisdiction or that respective constituent entity. And so... Maybe talk a little bit about um, some of the the challenges that that you see with that because I think it's a really important point that these are really just data points that are needed for that initial calculation, not necessarily kind of how they get aggregated. Yeah, I mean, I th I think you know the the, the biggest thing with, with the data points that you know with the globe return is I think it was was one hundred fifty or so data points. Um, I think as as we've dug in with taxpayers to to figure out well what are those data points what what actually needs to go into those data points um and like the the one that i think is the easiest to to kind of explain is the excluded dividends right um you know most companies do not have a line in, in a, a system anywhere that says excluded dividends for pillar two purposes so the question is is how many accounts how many sub ledgers how many whatever it may need to be we'll, we'll make that up so i think as we start to think about what really is going to go into the calculation we're starting to discover that those data points are, are much more than 150. Um, and I think it, and they also exist in a lot more different places. Right. And I, and I think even the, the OECD acknowledges that that's kind of data points by constituent entity. And I think that, you know, with some of the work we've done, when you kind of unpack some of those data points, I think we, you know, we're, we're, we've got significantly more up to 250 data points that, that we've mm -hmm. identified that just really go down to, to the next granular level. But you can imagine for, for taxpayers, like however many constituent entities they may have, which could be dozens or hundreds or in you know, some multinationals, thousands, thousands, right? You start doing that math and the, the exercise is overwhelming. Um, where, for the most part, and what we get this question a lot, where's this data located? You know, how do you, you use the comment like, well, it's automatic, right? This is financial statement. So can you talk about the pipe that needs to be plugged in to, to, to the magic data grinder? That well, I, think I, I like to refer, it? I like to call it the, the magic data grinder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just think of, you know, sausage getting made. You put the data on the top, it grinds out and it's all automatic. Nice casing and yeah, it tastes it, all good at the end. Exactly, right, right. yeah. Um, does does all the, the, the making, and you know, behind the scenes, you don't see it. Um, I, you're they, telling me that doesn't exist? Um, not right now. Okay. Um, well, there was a joke, but I won't, I won't, I won't go with that. Um, but uh, the, uh, I, I think you know, the answer is where's the data? And I think, unfortunately, the answer is everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think as we start to dig into what those data points are, we're finding data points in ERP systems. We're finding data in tax provisioning systems, consolidation systems, offline schedules, sub, I, like, you just you go on and on. Um, it's it really, depending on the client, depending on, on how they've um, looked at their systems, um, we're finding it everywhere. And it really is, unfortunately, more of a bespoke process than I think the hope was um, when coming up with like the, the theory and the thought of, oh, this would be automatic using financial statement data will you'll be easier to get at. I, I think we're discovering that it's not as, as simple as, as maybe hoped. Yeah, and I think, you know, for many taxpayers, frankly, I think the the view was, oh, well, we can source this from our ERP system. And from a practical perspective, I think, you know, for the most part, taxpayers have multiple ERP systems, or it's not mm -hmm. uncommon, I guess maybe I should say, that there are multiple ERP systems. But even if you have, to your point, one single ERP system, all of the information is not necessarily there within that ERP system. And so to your point, you have to look elsewhere, whether it's provisioning you know, tools, consolidation tools, or whatever, whatever the case may be. And so really important uh, to, to understand that um, it, it is a frankly an overwhelming and a novel ask, and and I think that the taxpayers, advisors that frankly haven't already started thinking about this, that you know a lot of conversations start with well what what is the where what is the modeling where is the top up tax potentially owed and it quickly becomes a, a data calculation. You gave one example on dividends for for globe income and some of the challenges of those calculations and sourcing data. Any example? Any other examples or examples with respect to covered taxes? Yeah, I mean, I think the big one in covered taxes is you know your deferred tax assets and how are you tracking those and then you know organizing those. I mean, if you look at the schedule, like going back to the the, the globe return, 
um, you know, you're going to have to fill out that schedule for each and every one of your DTAs. And I think a lot of taxpayers, a lot of that stuff gets amalgamated in places, right? It's, it's not, you know, one by one. So having to extract that information, having to organize that information to report it, but also for the calculation purposes, I think is going to be a, a pretty big, a pretty big ask. Uh, I think the same around, um, and this kind of goes um, on both sides, but um, is a lot of the elections. The, mm-hmm. A lot of elections will end up creating data that doesn't exist anywhere in a system. Um, so th- there's there's some apprehension right now about how do we handle the elections that are there, and then the you know how do we track that data because most of the elections are multi-year elections. Can you give an example? Well, the stock-based compensation election is a five-year election that y- you would you you'd be able to elect, but then again now you're tracking that data differently than you are in your financial statements. So now you have to track that somewhere. So so where is that? Is it in a spreadsheet? Is it in a system? Is it, you know, where do you have to do that? And that goes back to business process that you'll have to start to think about. And it's just, it's an extra complicating factor when you start to create data um, with, with, with any of these computations. Right. So I think, you know, as we kind of summarize here with the, the globe information return, I think the the most important point for listeners to take away is that this, at least in my view, is not the final return. And I, it's not even in my view. The OECD acknowledges that, that this really, to your point, is an initial volleying point for, for data. I, I think that it's a bit of a misnomer calling it the globe information return because it really is the starting point for, for data points. And I think that you know, if there is one request that the taxpayers advisors have is like is trying to actually get to consensus on a common return that that would be due, because if not, it will be very challenging for taxpayers to, to have to file, obviously, multiple returns, you know, across um, the, the world, depending on, you know, whether income inclusion rules and UTPRs or QDMTTs and just adds to adds to the complexity. So Mike, maybe if we turn now, because we, we talked about the safe harbors, we've talked about the globe information return and kind of here as we're, we're wrapping up, I mean, we haven't really spent a ton of time talking about actually calculating the pillar two liability. So, you know, presumably not every jurisdiction is going to be able to qualify for the safe harbors. Even if you do, there's still a bunch of work that, that needs to be done. We'll see what happens with the globe information return. But um, you know, one of the concerns that that I have for for taxpayers is that there may be multiple adoption or multiple different interpretations and adoptions of the pillar two rules. And this was acknowledged in frankly in the third um, document that was released by the OECD, um, thinking about dispute resolution in the context where different countries have different implementing rules for, for these globe rules. I think about from a just practical perspective, trying to do these calculations where you have, it's not just the model rules and commentary, you have to do a separate calculation for every country that implements a QDMTT or UTPR mm-hmm. and depending you know, if you have intermediary holding companies and these priority rules, um, that it really creates a, a, a lot of challenges. So um, how can technology help with that? And, and what is your view? Because as I think about trying to, to structure something like this in a spreadsheet environment, which you know is something where, that I grew up with, it, it, it really seems challenging, even for the most sophisticated taxpayers. Oh, it's, it's, it's definitely challenging. And I think if I think back to like where we started the podcast talking about how I got my start, um, one of the things we did back in the you know FISC days was we had a centralized rules engine. It, you know the technology that we used back then versus the technology we're using today, obviously has evolved <laughs> and changed a lot, right? right. But the, the the philosophy hasn't. Um, having a a centralized rules engine that can take data from any taxpayer, all taxpayers, and be able to perform the same rules against it, um, and and have a, a level of governance and review around it. Um, has paid dividends um, in in the international tax quantitative space, you know, for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I don't view this as anything different. I just view now, instead of us just looking, you know, kind of not to say the United States is small, but our small little world, we're now looking at the world. And we're going to need the world to help with making sure the rules are up to date, making sure they're, they're reviewed and signed off on, and the technology and the central rules engine to be able to process the data and know what country you're in so know what rules to apply to know if you have the you know intermediate hold codes um and so you know what do you do with those what do you do with you know the the partially owned parent entities Mm -hmm. you know just so the the key to that's going to be is having it centrally located having it 
a governance process around it is, is really the key, I think, to how you're going to be able to handle something as things are changing. Um, not only initially when people introduce the first set of rules and, you know, there's a small tweak, like in Korea, there's a small tweak um, that, that they made with how they're going to tax, um, you know, the IR. And so versus what, you know, was, what, what was in the EU directive. So there's going to be small tweaks. We're going to have to deal with that. There's going to be changes. Right. And, and there's going to be, you know, over, I would say over the next five years, there's going to be a mismatch of what countries are adopting, what countries are not adopting. How are they adopting? How are they adopting the effective rate, you know, effectiveness of the adoption? All that stuff's going to be in flux. So trying to do that in a spreadsheet environment, I just don't, I, I can't picture how that would actually work. Um, yeah, and, and, um, I, and I think just to, to tease out a couple of those is like the, on the EU directive, one of the important points for, for people to understand is that, you know, even in the directive now, obviously each of the, the EU member states will have to implement their own domestic legislation. But one of the, the things for the EU directive that significantly deviated from the model rules and commentary is that it requires member states to implement a um, income inclusion rule for the parent company jurisdiction. One presumes that's qualifying domestic minimum top up tax. But, you know, as we start to think about the ordering and, and the calculations mm -hmm. that that obviously that is fundamentally different. And to your point on on Korea, kind of a number of different uh, proposals that that were different um, from from Korea. You know, one was that the UTPR is effective one one twenty four. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now you're going to have to layer in, you know, the under tax profit rule potentially a year before other jurisdictions are implementing. And then to your point, there's also some differences in how the actual payments and what that tax liability um, could could be. Owed. I think that the the challenge that many taxpayers are going to have is that um, how do you, if to the extent that you're trying to do this compliance yourself and keep up with this, I, I don't think this is going to be a, a static area. In other words, I don't think the jurisdictions are going to implement these rules and then that's it. Like pillar two, like here's what you need to do. I envision that this is going to be a very dynamic area. And I think that you know you've been referencing, which is a great point, kind of U.S. taxpayers, U.S. multinationals guilty. Like, well, we've U.S. multinationals have have been having to do those calculations, but that's one set of rules, right, that applies to multiple jurisdictions, and that is complicated in and of itself without having to apply that. And as we all know, guilty is blending, and it's not country by country. This adder adds on more complexity than I think, frankly, most jurisdictions have ever seen. Um, including for U.S. MNCs, where obviously we're not going to have the, we're not going to implement Pillar 2, at least in the next couple of years with a divided Congress. I think the, the likelihood of that is exceedingly low. Um, but as jurisdictions or as other countries are implementing, there will be this, this patchwork, as I described, and will be very challenging for, for taxpayers to, to try to keep up with all of the various implementations as well as changes that are going to, to occur. And I think the, the part that, will be the most difficult is if, if if one jurisdiction comes out with something like a better term radically different i think that's easier to for you know taxpayers to get their head around and to, and to monitor i think it's going to be those little tweaks the little things that are different that and that are in a, a dozen different places who's going to remember 18 months from now that there's an extra step in korea to who, how they're paying the tax right because probably korea potentially is not top of mind Right. right. So I think I think it's going to be those little things. And that's where the centralized rules engine, when you apply the same rules every time, that's those things get caught. If you're in the spreadsheet environment, there's a there's a potentially likelihood that that gets forgotten, that gets deleted, that gets what, whatever it may be. And I think it's the little things that are going to trip folks up in the spreadsheet environment. Yeah. And, and, and to that point, you know, you talk about the big deviations. I think, you know, implementing jurisdictions just by the nature of the rules are incentivized not to significantly right. deviate, right? Because, and who, listen, they still could, right? But at the risk of not being a qualifying mm -hmm. IR, not being a qualified good, a good pillar two tax, um, which could then significantly impact that jurisdiction's ability to be able to, to, to collect taxes or potentially be subject to tax. And so I would anticipate to your point that those most of the changes will be really small. So maybe in conclusion, Mike here, what advice do you have for, for taxpayers and advisors um, with respect to, I mean, it's early, it's the first quarter of the calendar year here in 2023. What advice do you have for taxpayers knowing that this is now on the horizon for tax years, um, ending uh, or beginning on or after 1231 2020, 
three, which is this year. So in, uh, you know, in a, less than a year away. Well, what is your advice? Get started. Um, Cause I, I, as we talked about, especially with the data, um, start to understand where the data is, start to understand what your current business process are of how you get your data today. Um, if it's for CBCR or, or for this, um, it, you know, I don't think you can start early enough. Uh, cause I think you, you will quickly, as your point, it's this year, um, you know, you're going to run out of, you're going to run out of time. And right. so I would, you know, start, start now. I think that's sound advice. And, and the other thing which we haven't covered is for publicly traded companies, whether you're non U S parented subject to IFRS or U S gap, we still don't have a um, tremendous amount of certainty as, as to with respect to how IESB, I know there was a proposed um, announcement for period accounting with some limitations. We haven't heard from the SEC and the FASB. So I think that's something that a lot of us are all looking to also understand because the challenge could be for taxpayers is that as jurisdictions that the taxpayers operate in enact these rules, you need to start thinking potentially about the deferred tax accounting, which is going to require some significant work, which then goes to your point of like, how do you get the data? So, so start right. immediately, I think is, uh, is great advice. All right. Well, Mike, thank you very much for joining. A great discussion. Uh, lots to, to continue to talk about as we see these various jurisdictions implement uh, the Pillar 2 rules. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Michael Lecky, PwC's International Tax Services Global Technology Leader. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Global Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.